Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Amber Mace, and I am the Executive Director of the California Council on Science and Technology. We're delighted to have you here to talk about renewable energy storage and the technologies that are advancing to help us. Today, I want to first introduce our organization to you, then tell you a little bit about our Disaster Resilience Initiative, and then I'm going to turn it right over to our moderator, Jenea Scott, to jump into this conversation. So we are a nonpartisan nonprofit. The California Council on Science and Technology was created at the request of the legislature over 30 years ago to be a resource to the state of California to provide science and technology advice from California's wealth of academic and research institutions across the state. We are very lucky in California to have such an incredible network of expertise. And our job at CCST is to help amplify and translate and turn this knowledge that's produced in, the Cal in California into actionable advice for policymakers. And we do this through a number of mechanisms. One is this briefing that we have here today. We also develop workshops and peer reviewed technical reports. And we have a fellowship program where we place PhD scientists and engineers for a year of government service and leadership training in our CCST science fellows program in the executive branch and in the legislature. They are a fantastic way to link science directly with policy by serving with policymakers directly. So we are very happy here to have a whole team of experts to talk to you about energy storage. And this relates to our disaster resilience initiative. This is something that we've launched to help California be better prepared for, to be better able to respond to, and better able to recover from a whole suite of disasters that we face here in California, from climate-related disasters to cyber attacks, to a pandemic and energy storage absolutely fits in. This is a topic that relates to California meeting its carbon neutrality goals and also to dealing with grid reliability and disasters. So today is a really important opportunity to hear about the latest technology. I am so grateful that our moderator, Janaea Scott, is here to lead us through this conversation with our team of experts. Uh, I'd like to introduce her now. She is the Senior Counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals at the U.S. Department of the Interior and former Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission. She is a nationally recognized expert in renewable energy policy. She's also the recipient of CCST's Science and Public Service Award, and it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jenea. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, Amber, and good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and for inviting me to be here today. I'm, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this morning's panel. And so, uh, as Amber mentioned, we'll be talking about how storage and resilience fit in together. To address the threat of climate change, California Senate Bill um, SB 100 mandates that 100% of electricity in California must be served from carbon neutral sources by 2045. However, because many sources of renewable energy like solar and wind are intermittent or dependent on weather conditions, there is frequently a mismatch between the production and the demand. So large scale and long-term storage of renewable energy will be necessary to help ensure California achieves its goal of a reliable carbon neutral electric grid. Today, I have four experts working on current and emerging energy storage technologies that will be uh, necessary for California to meet California's SB 100 goal of 100% renewable energy by 2045. And I'm so pleased to introduce them to you this morning. So first I'd like to ask um, Dr. Noelle Bakhtian to please turn on her camera. She is the executive director of Berkeley Lab in, um, of the Berkeley Lab Energy Storage Center. Good morning, Noelle. Hi, Janu. Would you like to take just a moment to introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Thanks, Jania. So just a little bit about me. I'm Noelle Bakhtian. I actually started out in aerospace and fluid dynamics with a PhD from Stanford uh, and doing research at NASA Ames back in the day. I took a year to go to Washington, D.C. to learn how science policy gets made, and it ended up turning into five years working in the U.S. Senate, the Department of Energy headquarters, running the day-to-day -day of the Wave Energy Prize, and standing up the Energy Water Nexus Program for International Affairs, 
And then I got an opportunity to go out and work at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as a senior policy advisor. Um, from there, I moved over to the National Lab System. And I wanna just spend a second talking to you all about that. The Department of Energy actually owns 17 national labs across the country, representing about a $30 trillion annual investment. Experimental capabilities, billion dollar pieces of equipment available for public research, tens of thousands of researchers, and the expertise is just incredible. So I was at Idaho National Lab previously running a research education and innovation consortium of four universities in a national lab. But as for my current job, which is extremely exciting, I just moved over to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in November. We shortened it and call it Berkeley Lab uh, as inaugural director of this energy storage center that Jenny had mentioned. So Berkeley Lab is really the place to be for energy storage. It's where lithium ion electrochemistry was invented in the 1950s, which led to the lithium ion battery, which has taken the world by storm. And we've been breaking barriers on energy storage ever since. Berkeley Lab is really known for team science, for our science all the way to systems work, for the 14 Nobel Prizes, and for our incredibly tight relationship with the University of California system and the Bay Area entrepreneurial community. And our energy storage center includes over 100 principal investigators working on energy storage topics from electrochemical, like think batteries, to chemical storage, think hydrogen, to mechanical storage, think compressed air storage, to thermal storage, and of course, markets and analysis as well. We're always looking to collaborate with communities, industry, government at all levels, academia, and any others. So please, please reach out to me if you're interested in partnering. And I just wanna close by saying it's an honor every day to be working with these dedicated researchers and it's a privilege to be here today representing them. So thanks Jenea and thanks to CCST. Thank you and welcome Noel. And then I'd like to introduce to you our next panelist who is Dr. Joan Casey. She is an assistant professor at Columbia University and Joan, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, really glad to be here with you today and uh, good afternoon from the East Coast. Um, I'm an assistant professor of environmental health sciences at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. A lot of my research focuses on energy production and health outcomes. I've studied things like fracking or coal-fired power plants. Um, some more recent work is focused on power outages and how those might affect uh, public health. And in particular, we've been focusing on this interesting group of people that are dependent on electricity for medical equipment at home. And so there's actually a large number of people in California and elsewhere who fall into that category. Um, and then kind of the final thing that I focus on is in environmental justice research and how certain subpopulations are disproportionately exposed uh, to environmental toxins. And so related to that, I've been thinking about electricity production and environmental equity um, we have worked on a project in the past looking at peaker power plants in California, and these are the really dirty plants that turn on in times of high electricity demand. And we did a paper looking at how we could most equitably shut those down based on um, Cal and virus screen, the type of community they're located in, as well as how polluting those facilities were. So kind of that sort of thinking that goes into potentially this work on energy storage. So very glad to be here. Uh, thanks. Welcome, Joan. We're glad to have you here. And then next, I would like to introduce to you um, Professor Robert Cormia. He is on the chemistry faculty of Foothill College. So Robert, please go ahead. Good morning. morning from, good morning from Northern California. Energy storage, both thermal and electrical, is a real game changer in decarbonization and provides opportunities to store and manage solar energy during peak production, give us a boost in power during demand side reduction, and be the heart, the pumping engine uh, in thermal electric microgrids, which are the next generation of California energy, excuse me, campus energy systems. California community colleges can play a special role in leading large scale decarbonization. Many of our campuses are 50 years old. They have large uh, hydronic systems with traditional chillers um, and natural gas boilers, and we need to replace them. Leading the way is Stanford University, which developed a thermal or total energy, uh, central energy facility known as SESI, the Stanford Energy Systems Innovation. And it's a billion dollar project that will save them $400 million in energy costs over 20 years and reduce greenhouse gases by about two thirds over the next two thirds. 
uh, to, excuse me, the next few years. Partnering with Electricity uh, de France, EDF Labs in Los Altos, which is the world's largest electricity and the American Public Power Institution, Stanford uh, described this integrated electric system, thermal electric uh, microgrids in a white paper, which I'll share the link with in a bit, as a template for natural gas, uh, replacing natural gas and heat recovery chillers and uh, integrating solar PPAs. Uh, EDF Labs in the Innovation Lab sponsored a project. They supported us in 2019, uh, looking at our 2018 data from Foothill College's much smaller central energy facility. And we developed a specification using a tool called, called TOTEM, the tool for optimization of thermal electric microgrids. And using EDF's tool, we were able to look at our current system and ask if we added a little bit more solar, another half a megawatt to our one and a half uh, megawatts of solar, what would the system look like? Could we purchase our power through a PPA? And what we found using this tool is that a $10 million capital equipment investment could replace the majority of our natural gas and potentially our cogeneration, reducing our total natural gas by 75% and thus really most of our, our legacy fossil fuel emissions. Uh, the district, uh, Foothill Dianza College District, uh, was very blessed to receive a bond measure in March of 2020, Measure G. That will provide funding for us to start to create an RFI, an RFP, to start to replace our natural gas driven systems with heat recovery chillers, thermal and electric microgrids, which are an in integrated engine like your heart and your lungs and using this as really developing a platform for the next generation energy systems. I wanna quickly close and say that California community colleges and the state of California together, that we can be leaders in these large scale decarbonization projects and that these are an enormous economic opportunity, not just a game changer in uh, managing emissions. Wonderful, welcome Robert. And then um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce to you, Dr. Sarah Kurtz, who is a professor at UC Merced in the College of Engineering. Um, Sarah, please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to join you all today. Um, I was more than 30 years at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, but have now been at UC Merced for a little more than um, three years. It's a real pleasure and excitement to be, California has been leading the charge on adopting solar energy. It's really fun to be a small piece of that. And I was so privileged to be selected to work on a CEC project uh, to study the value of long duration storage. And we're working with um, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and University of Texas, Austin, um, to understand how we can mix together the different sources of clean, sustainable energy with the storage. They're the questions of what do you do when the sun sets? What do you do on cloudy days or windless days? And as the seasons vary, what do you do to balance the supply and the demand? And it's a really exciting time because the world is changing so fast and there's so many technologies that are just ready to be adopted. So it's, it's a ex very exciting project and I look forward to talking with everyone here more about all those technologies. Well, wonderful, welcome. So um, as you all can see, we have a fantastic panel. I'm really looking forward to getting all of your questions. And so just a reminder about how to use the Q&A feature. Um, please use that Q&A feature to submit your questions to our panel along with your name and your affiliation. And I will be um, working to read through those questions. I have a whole list that I would love to ask the panelists, but would, um, would really welcome hearing um, from all of you in the audience what your questions are. And so I'm going to open up by asking our um, experts, what are the currently available options for renewable energy storage? And who would like to jump in? Sarah, please go ahead. I'm happy to give a, a quick summary. We have historically used primarily pumped hydropower. Now lithium ion batteries are just ready to pop. They're in the queue for um, a, a connection in California. There's more than hundred gigawatts being planned and around the world they're being adopted. 
Compressed air has also been around only with a couple of installations worldwide, but there are new innovations that are improving the efficiency and the scalability of that. We have flow batteries and liquid air that is ready to go and is already being installed in commercial large size systems. Thermal storage can be used in so many different flavors, so many different innovations of how you can get the energy in and use it for different things. Then, then there are um, things that people probably haven't heard of, geomechanical storage where you can store energy in the rocks. And of course, you have green hydrogen that as that is being developed around the world, um, the, the infrastructure to handle a hydrogen-based energy economy and the ability to get the green hydrogen to be cost-effective um, is really phenomenal. And in the end, I think the some of the most interesting innovative things that are going to come is to think differently about how we run our energy system. And when you think about it, um, almost everything around us can be used as storage in that we can, um, you can, if you want to air condition your house, you can actually chill ice and then use that ice as a form of storage um, or pumping the water at a time when there's electricity available and then having the, the water available instead of needing to pump it um, at just a particular moment. There are lots and lots of different ways we can think about it. And um, a lot of these technologies are at a pivotal point. You can't launch a technology before the market exists, but you want to develop the technology just at the time the market is ripening. And we have really a mixture of technologies that are positioned to do that. That's a fantastic overview. Would any of the other panelists like to weigh in? Maybe I'll just throw in, since we started talking about the future as well, that the scale of uh, the amount of storage that's going to need to be deployed is enormous. Uh, and, and so we need to be thinking about, uh, and we have the opportunity to think about the potential for new technologies and getting their costs down. And we need to be thinking about supply chain for all of this. And, and uh, it, it's going to be a big challenge, but it's going to be a fun one. Indeed. Any of the other panelists like to weigh in on, on this one? Oh, yes, Robert, please go ahead. Okay, I'm unmuting. Uh, no, that was a, a great overview. I think there's probably an algorithm that we should look for that would scale the amount of storage to the amount of photovoltaic energy. And we're looking at, say, for having two megawatts of solar power on campus, having somewhere around one megawatt hour of, of electrical energy storage. If you look at a tremendous solar energy build out and use that same two to one ratio, that again, that's an enormous, um, it's an enormous vest, uh, a need. And it's also, again, an economic opportunity. It's dollar spend, but it's also an in end investment. Excellent. All right, let me go on to our next question, which is how can renewable energy storage help California increase its resiliency in the face of increasing risk of disasters? So uh, Noel, I see you're unmuted. Why don't you take, let's start with. Uh, sure, absolutely. I think Joan probably has a really good answer for this, but I just wanted to share one, one um, a, few, a few ideas. One is we've, we've got some researchers working on uh, microgrids and thinking about in the event of a disaster, thinking about all of the assets out there that people have, um, whether it's their EVs or if we have storage or, or we have got uh, PV. So they're doing a project on how would you optimally connect all these things to be able to help you know, the most amount of people or the critical services or whatever. Uh, the other one that I'm really excited about is a kind of out there idea, but um, our researchers have done the math on it and show that it, it's uh, feasible. And in fact, their research just got, um, uh, is about to get published in Nature Energy, which is a big deal. And this is a concept around looking at uh, the trains around the country. And right now, all of the freight trains in the country are run um, using diesel, which is obviously very dirty, not ideal, and something we'll wanna electrify. Well, the concept is what if we, uh, include a battery car on each of these trains. It can already be set up through the electric drive that already exists on the locomotives. So we could have clean powered trains using batteries that are already cost effective today. Uh, but the really exciting piece here is the resilience that you mentioned, Jenea, which is all of a sudden now we have a, uh, we have 250 gigawatt hours of, of battery electric storage 
that can be deployed because it's on wheels, right? Batteries on wheels that can be deployed to California. They can be deployed if there's another event in Texas, et cetera. And so this is a concept that we're thinking about. We're looking for partners right now. Uh, we're talking to folks across the state and across the nation. So if there's folks out there that are interested in this, please, please reach out. I like that. And, and Joan, would you like to weigh in as well? Sure, I don't have anything quite that fancy, but uh, I do think storage can really help us from a public health perspective in, in times of disaster. So, you know, thinking about California and wildfires, that's obviously the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and so having more localized storage that can keep parts of the grid on or allow for a centralized community center to provide electricity for people that need it, for example, to charge medical devices or to get in contact with their family uh, would be a very powerful tool. Um, and we also can think about that, especially in these planned public safety shutoffs that we see a lot of during wildfire season. And so uh, there can be messaging around where to go to charge. And, and this can be extremely helpful so that Californians don't go 48 plus hours without any electricity. So I think that's, that's going to become increasingly important. Absolutely. And I see that Robert's turned his camera on as well. Sure. The, the piece I would add, I live on a 10 acre ranch in a rural area in Northern California. We are no strangers to power shutoffs or fires. And when we look at resiliency, having nanoscale systems integrating solar with perhaps propane generation and uh, energy storage at both the nano grid and then a community level, say the town of La Honda, and then the larger storage areas around us, that again, this is a huge infrastructure, top-down and bottom-up uh, rethinking of resiliency. Terrific. All right, and as I turn to the next question, let me um, remind folks that you can use the Q&A feature to submit your question to our panel. And um, if you put your name and affiliation, we'll say that as well. And so next I have a question from Brian Picus, who's at Caltrans in San Diego. And his question is, what can we do in our projects, both electrical and civil, to promote energy storage other than installing solar panel and battery backup systems? So I'd like to answer that. Yes, um, there are many, many different things you can do, but I see that the number one priority right now should be moving to daytime charged electric vehicles. And Caltrans is in a very unique position that in all the park and rides, if they could install solar with electric vehicle charging, what that does is you may think we're talking about storage. Why are you not saying, Sarah, that you should um, invest in storage? But in this case, what happens is that each customer invests in a battery in their electric vehicle. And then by providing that infrastructure, Caltrans can give away that those um, vehicles, when they're parked at the park and ride during the day, can be charged from the solar electricity. And if you look at the evaluation of where the carbon emissions are currently in California and the, the cost um, benefit ratios, moving to electric vehicle and daytime charging from solar is one of the fastest pathways to getting us to reduce carbon emissions. Fantastic. And I believe Robert would like to weigh in as well. Yeah, really quickly, Sarah could not have said it better. Um, I have a plug-in electric. And when you sit down and you do the math and realize that the utility wants to promote us charging at nighttime, we're charging with natural gas. So we've shifted from petroleum to natural gas. It, when we bring an electric vehicle in service, we need to add a certain amount of solar energy for that vehicle, have it somewhere where our cars will park, so that as we grow electric vehicles, we're also growing our solar and the storage in the system. And then it's a true transition away from petroleum. Excellent. I'm so sorry. There's a tiny little fly and it is just all in my face <laughs> right now. So hopefully it's not buzzing loud enough that you can hear it inside my, uh, my speakers. But hey, you know, I would love to ask a uh, follow-up. So I'm sorry if I keep uh, waving around at you. Um, a follow-up question to one of the things that Robert mentioned a minute or so ago, which was thinking about how much storage do we need um, if we're going to have all of the solar, wind, other renewables out there. And I'm wondering if anyone here is working on thinking about where do we need to put the different um, storage as we build out. And so I would love to ask that question to the panel. 
Yeah, we've Noel, got, please go ahead. Yeah, we've got researchers thinking about thinking about that um, uh, and at all levels, thinking about uh, what does it mean to be a hybrid system? And, and does it make sense to be co-locating solar plus storage or wind plus storage? In fact, there was a major DOE report that just came out in the last two months on that. Uh, and then separate Berkeley reports because we were one of the, the main helpers on that report. Um, um, all the way down to thinking about uh, charging stations and fast charging stations. Uh, so so at, at all levels, we're definitely thinking about location, in, including expanding this and, and thinking about you know, hydrogen uh, and, and other types of storage as well. Where does it make sense for us to be uh, locating the, the hydrogen storage versus where it's going to be produced, et cetera. So it's, it's definitely a systems, it's definitely a complex problem, uh, but there's teams working on this. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I think what places is um, short-term storage more useful, what places is longer-term storage use more useful, and you know which, which types of technologies you might want to pair the storage with. So it's exciting to hear about. Um, Sarah, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so I might say, um, if you compare the benefit of distributed storage and distributed solar, what you find is that people still need the electricity when the, the sun isn't shining. So if you distribute the solar, you still need to have the grid there. But to the extent that you're actually able to put in enough storage, and of course there's a question with the seasonal storage, whether we're actually able to do that in California, but to the extent that you're able to put in enough storage to make sure that you can always meet the needs in that local area, um, you may be able to really decrease the investment in the, the transmission grid at some point. So the, the equation shifts a little bit when you start talking about the distribution of storage as opposed to the distribution of um, the solar or wind. And the other piece of that is that there are a lot of forms of storage that work best if they are locally sited. And so I, I mentioned before the possibility of making ice and then using the ice to, to keep things cool all through the night after the sun has set. And um, that kind of local storage um, has to be distributed because you can't move the, the thermal energy around that far. Great, I, I appreciate those thoughts and those answers. And I might ask um, Joan if you wanted to weigh in here as well in terms of when we're thinking through um, public health and equity and some of the other benefits that storage could bring. Um, you know, are there, are there key places or key lessons that you've learned in your research where, oh wow, if we had storage right here, it could really make a difference for a, a community? Yeah, I think there are a lot of different elements that we'll wanna think about. So. Um, from a pub public health perspective, one is just population density. So how many people can benefit from having this storage near them? Um, two, from an environmental perspective, where are disasters going to happen? Where can this really provide grid resiliency uh, so that we have fewer vulnerable people losing power for extended periods of time? And then three, from an equity perspective, we wanna make sure these aren't all sited in high income neighborhoods. We wanna make sure that um, this actually can hopefully improve health equity. And so one important thing to think about there is baseline environmental exposures. And so I mentioned this a little bit in my introduction, but if we can site storage in places such that they can, they can replace polluting uh, power plants, that would be a really great step forward. And we've actually already kind of laid out, I'll drop in the chat for folks our paper on this, but things we can think about in order to have the greatest marginal benefit for pulling, for example, peaker plants offline and replacing them with storage. Um, and so that, again, is a combination of the socio-demographics of people living in a community, how polluting the power plant is that we could replace. Um, and so these things together can kind of help us make policy decisions moving forward. And I'll mention Cal California has this great tool, Cal Screen that has already been developed and is used in a lot of policy making. And I think this is another area where we could draw on Cal Screen to identify disadvantaged communities and make sure that they're at the very least equally benefiting from uh, installed storage. Thank you. Here, yes, Noel. Since you're talking about equity, I just wanted to throw out that maybe a little bit separate from the siting uh, concept, but Storage in general, uh, whether it's um, you know grid scale or uh, or not, is is really going to help on the equity uh, concern because it's going to help us lower peak demand. 
which is going to have effect in, in the energy needs we have at that time and then the cost. So overall, it, the energy storage is, is going to make a big difference as well. Excellent. All right. Let me turn to our next question, which is from Katarina Robinson, a legislative director for Senator Skinner. And her question is, what holes do you see in existing state policy or statute? Or do we already have the policy in place needed for advancement of these technologies at state agencies? Let's see, who'd like to take that on? Robert, I see your camera on. I just wanna throw out this again, uh, impassioned uh, plea that we look at this as an investment opportunity in the state of California, uh, flush with tens of billions of dollars of surplus, which is, it may only be temporary, but if we can redirect a lot of that into uh, many of these projects and get them going, it will take more than policy in terms of a feed-in. We have to actually start building things and see how it goes and really doing things in scale. Uh, we're going to see temperature increase probably more rapidly than we expected. So having a little start on this Moore's law for decarbonization, uh, again, it's an economic opportunity and an investment in uh, human capital. I, I might also add just, it seems like California is um, leading the country in terms of adopting policy, but there's still room to do lots more. And returning to the, the theme about the, the near-term policy that could be really useful is, as, as Robert was um, underscoring what I said about the daytime charging of electric vehicles, we still across the, the state have a lot of programs that encourage daytime charging. And a lot of the investment in, in charging infrastructure is very complicated because you want to get it to people who live in apartment buildings and elsewhere who won't have the access. But, figuring out how we can actually charge the cars during the day and then installing solar to be able to go along with that will is the opportunity right now. And I, I don't always see that the policy around um, the infrastructure for charging is really focusing on that daytime charging. And I'll just throw out a few other ideas. Um, so at the bulk power level, thinking about uh, very high upfront costs um, especially compared to low natural gas prices, thinking about technology maturity, which we need to advance in some cases, and also thinking about the long interconnection process. Um, and then, you know, on the distributed storage side, uh, there's limited coordination right now between transmission and distribution operators. Um, uh, something to think about uh, the rules and regulations around participation of distributed storage resources um, at, at all levels. Uh, et cetera. And then I think distributed batteries are going or likely to need to provide grid services via an aggregator, um, but the rules and requirements for doing that are still being worked out through FERC order uh, 2222. Um, so there's, there's a, a lot that we can look at as far as how to streamline all of this and just make it easier to get storage out onto the grid and useful. I think Robert had a follow-up to that as well. Yes, and this really plays to the equity component. When we look at electric vehicle charging um, and the, the promotional plans that we see now are to hand out power um, electric vehicle chargers, which is a great thing, but most of the cost is in the make ready infrastructure. So it's under the ground, getting the cable in from a transformer, getting it safely to a wall, getting it outdoor set, and then bolting the less expensive charger to it. From an equity standpoint, how do we bring that infrastructure into areas that don't attract, attract that kind of investment as the, as the first tier? And speaking of equity, I'll add some more ideas that we have in there. Um, you know, potential to create a financial incentive program to reduce the upfront costs um, so it could be more easily and equitably accessed through different financial arrangements that work for different types of customers is one creating different ownership models um, that limit the financial challenges associated with procuring the necessary upfront capital. And then the last one is just thinking about different rates and, and programs that create opportunities for customers to access those financial benefits that distributed battery storage can provide on terms and conditions that work for different circumstances and customer types. 
And I just might add um, with my, my previous hat as the vice chair of the Energy Commission overseeing our um, EPIC research program, a lot of times what we were looking at also were how to make some of those things either replicable, so you could take it from one community and move it to the next, move it to the next, move it to the next, or to make it scalable. So a lot of times um, you're putting some research dollars into three or four different projects, but your hope is again, that they will be replicable or will be scalable so that you can really push the technology out in a, in a smart way. Um, Joan, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on this kind of rebate program idea. Um, and I think we actually really have something to learn from the clean vehicle rebate programs that have taken place in California since 2010 um, and in, in terms of an equity lens. And so initially, California provided um, some rebates between $1,500 and I think $3,500 for people buying electric vehicles. Uh, they realized that all, almost everyone that was getting the electric vehicles were high income. So then in 2016, they instituted an income cap of $150,000 for the rebates. Some analysis from folks, including Rachel Morello Frosch at Berkeley, um, determined this actually didn't really change the distribution of who was getting electric vehicles. And it wasn't until a second policy came into place that had much stronger rebates and a much more stringent income cap um, and provided up to, I think, $9,000 in rebates. Um, that we actually saw an equity improvement in terms of who is able to get electric vehicles. So I just don't want to understate kind of the links we will need to go to in order to make storage more equitable. Um, and just one other thing that sometimes folks don't think about is when people are living in multifamily units or apartment buildings, uh, if you, you can't really have individual storage at all, it's not available to you. You can't, you know, you can't have, and you also can't have a generator. Um, and so it's important to think about in places that have a lot of apartment buildings or multifamily units that we do have more of like a community style centralized um, energy storage set up in order to provide backup power to folks in those sorts of um, situations. And by the way, I think just piggybacking on that, uh, I, the way I've learned it, that's part of the reason this fast charging um, research uh, portfolio has really been growing is recognizing that there's a lot of people who don't have their own garage and have the time to charge something for, you know, a few hours, but we're trying to get the charging of batteries for electric vehicles down to like eight minutes or whatever it is, what, however long you'd, you'd spend in a, in a gas station. Uh, and so that I think came in part from an equity lens, which I think is really great. Awesome. And I think uh, thinking through also where, where are more places where people are lingering for a little while, right? So the grocery store, the mall, the Target, different places like that as well. Um, we have a question from Chris Rudnicki, who is a PhD student at UC Riverside. And the question is, are there any efforts to recycle old batteries, wiring them together to improve the energy storage capacity of California? I'll just throw out that um, Second Life batteries are a really interesting um, idea and folks are starting to think about it. And I've got some folks that are thinking about startups in that space. So it's a really exciting idea and a lot of potential. Yes, Robert. I uh, was looking for some uh, local energy storage, just wondering what it would cost. And lo and behold, uh, the first two companies I found searching were Second Life batteries. And so it was a way to give life uh, to a system, not fast charging, fairly durable, uh, not necessarily deep cycling, but they're out there. And I think that those economies uh, will naturally evolve. We also had, um, again, with my previous hat of the vice chair of the Energy Commission through the EPIC program, some uh, research dollars that were also going to look into Second Life batteries, how they could be used, how, how long could they be used, how could you wire them together. So um, a few interesting projects in that space um, through the Energy Commission as well. Any others like to, oops, like to weigh in on this one? Okay, let us see. Our next question is from Colby Morrow. And the question is, the panel mentioned folks being out of power for 24 to 48 hours, especially during fires. Please discuss options for long-term storage that might address those situations. We'd like to take that one on. Robert, go ahead and then I see Sarah. 
Sure, and, and I'll be quick um, because we have other panelists that have really done the research here. Uh, LBNL published a paper on nanogrids um, over a decade ago, and I think that the bottom up building of resiliency is super important so that the microgrids don't have to support the entire community. This is an anti equity, but those people who can afford to build out these systems, these nanogrids, will put less demand on a community as the rest of the community needs that power. So it's a shared investment. It just looks a little different. Great, Sarah. So to be able to get through multiple days of outages, being able to have solar to recharge the batteries is really very useful. And there, there are, um, it is possible today to buy other systems, but in terms of what's most cost-effective, the most cost-effective today will be um, a solar system with battery um, storage. Great, would anyone else like to weigh in on long-term storage? I think Sarah, you had mentioned uh, green hydrogen and you had also mentioned, uh, I think it was called geomechanical storage. And I don't know whether that was a long-term or, or a short-term, but um, maybe you well, wanna add a couple more details there. Well, certainly I can talk lots more. If you get me started, that might be dangerous. But the um, in terms of things that can be done at a home, um, you might want to be looking at like flow batteries now can be, are being made up to say a hundred hours of storage or something. And you can also look at potentially gravity storage. You can look at maybe lifting blocks that then can just sit there. And then if there's a power, a nice thing about the gravity storage is you could put the blocks there, lift them one time, just charge them one time, and then any time in the next 10 years, they could be ready to go. Whereas if you charge a battery, a lot of batteries, if it sits for a year without getting recharged, so you have to continually um, try to top it off. Now, geomechanical is not one that um, can be easily done at a residence or in a small scale. It's more um, designed to be more at multi-megawatt um, scale where um, water is pumped down into a cavity in the ground that then compresses the rock around it. And then the compressed rock acts as a spring to then force the water back out and generate more electricity later. But that would be better, um, not done for a single building or even um, a single um, campus or something, but for a, a utility scale plant. Did you ask me to talk about any of the others? Liquid air is really fun. If anybody's played with <laughs> nitrogen, to think about you seen as the liquid nitrogen comes out, it goes shh, and you get this blast of, of expansion as it, as it um, vaporizes. And so if you take liquid air, it gives you a way to quickly um, give energy. And so that's another one that's coming. And as they, they're doing um, multiple demonstration plants, if they can get their costs down a little bit more, that will also be able to get 24 hours or more of storage potentially. Currently they're looking at shorter times for the, the standard um, implementation. Again, you probably would not do a liquid air for a single um, home. It would be better for utility scale um, implementation. Oh, this is great. I appreciate the distinction between for a single home and then things that would be long-term um, duration. I, um, so thank you for reminding us of that clarification and um, providing some additional information on the technologies. It's really exciting and interesting to hear what's out there. Joan, please go ahead. And then uh, Noelle. I just have a very quick follow-up and Noelle may know the answer. Uh, so Sarah mentioned solar and storage is probably the best thing in a single family home for these longer term outages. I'm wondering what folks know about solar panel efficiency when there's a wildfire and it's extremely hazy and, or the panels are getting covered in ash. And so how does this work during a wildfire event when people losing power are probably in very smoky conditions? Um, so they, they like. when that happened last year and we did indeed get some really bad um, smoke it also meant that smoke meant that the really high temperatures we'd been having um, were alleviated. And so what that allows is that the high air conditioning loads and often the air conditioning loads are the worst. And so the beauty of um, that, the implementation of that system, and I wanna be clear that it's not 100% guaranteed, but the beauty is that as the um, sunshine is reduced, it also tends to reduce the temperatures, which tends to reduce the load. And so, there is um, a balancing effect there. But it is to say that 
yes, it is possible. The, the output of the, especially when the ash actually landed on the modules and the, the output of the modules can go down substantially. If you, I mean, if you cover them over so that they're opaquely covered, then they're not going to generate anything. But fortunately you can go out and wipe them off and then they'll start working again. But the, the number I think I remember is 20% decrease in efficiency. Um, 20% is standard for um, the amount of soiling we get here in Merced anyway, during like we don't get any rain for six months or 10 months or whatever. Um, last, when, when the huge fires hit and there was like ash, visible ash in the air in Berkeley and places like that, um, I saw data that did decrease for a day or two the output as much as 90%. But I think that that's pretty extreme. And I think that was a pretty localized thing. And in more, most places, the output might drop more um, by a factor of two. You know, historically, I don't think people have viewed um, smoke as being something that really blocked the sun so much. But last year's fires kind of, I think, changed people's thinking about the potential for um, the, it really decreased the statewide output of, of solar in a, in a way that was um, quite marked. And Noel, oh. I don't know if you had a follow-up question or an, uh, an additional thought, and then Robert after Noel. Oh, yeah, just an additional thought as we were talking about other technologies. Another one to consider uh, is thermal energy storage, a different kind of thermal energy storage, um, not necessarily warming or chilling water, but thinking well, we'll, we've got work on this actually of optimizing a material that's able to get heated to the level of like lava temperatures, really, really, really hot and it's super safe because then the all of the energy is being stored as heat. So th there's nowhere else for the energy to go. It's ready in heat form. Um, and so we're working with uh, a few companies on this new kind of technology that could be used potentially for long duration. Great, Robert. So there's an organization, I believe they're out in Colorado called Homer Energy. And they've been involved in the development and education of microgrids for well over a decade. As PSPS events hit us a couple years ago, I reached out to them and suggested that they partner with uh, folks in California and say PG&E and really develop a thinking and a template so that we can build these small nano grids fairly quickly. Today, very few electricians understand anything more than adding solar and adding batteries to it. And there's no demand management, there's no dynamic component to it. Um, if we add that extra oomph of having a natural gas generator or propane generator, it's going to require just a little bit of thinking. But once we get that down as a model, I think we can really expand it. Excellent. Okay. Our next question is from Ben Landis, the founder of Creative Externalities. And the question is, many among the coming generation of homeowners are eager to adopt PV storage tech but the market is confusing and systems and financing are complex. What policy or technology leaps do we need to truly democratize home energy into appliance scale technology here in California? That's a great one, Robert, go ahead. You're on mute, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> muted. I was immutable. I apologize. So just building on what I've been pitching so far, this is a great economic opportunity. There's a sweet spot in 25, 30, 40K systems that you can come in and they're all designer built. But I think it's a, a combination of utilities really need to get behind this. And the first systems are going to be more expensive. So to address the equity issue, I think we have to build out the expensive systems first as really leading the way and then get that price down through the expansion of units. Great, would any other of our panelists like to weigh in on that? Okay, let me go to our next question. Um, let's see. So I think maybe the next question would be, what are the barriers to increase or challenges to increasing storage capacity in the state? Folks have any thoughts on, on barriers or challenges that we see in increasing our energy storage? I think we touched on some of them earlier. Yeah, um, that's true. 
Um, but I'll just mention again, the maybe I'll mention one that hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, it's a little out there, but uh, just the scale of the um, amount of storage that's gonna be needed, not just in the state, but nationally, globally, right? As, as we're realizing the value of energy storage for all things, transportation, grid, um, buildings, you know, industrial needs like manufacturing, remoteness and resilience, it's gonna be huge. And something that a lot of us are thinking about and a little worried about is supply chain, which I mentioned before. So um, uh, just considering the amount of lithium that's gonna be needed as an example. And right now only, I think 2% of the global lithium market comes from the United States. Uh, so that's a supply chain issue. Thinking about um, the cobalt and nickel used in these lithium ion batteries generally. And those are coming from states like Russia or countries like Russia, countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so the, the federal administration actually released um, an executive order probably, what, four months ago now on um, thinking about critical supply chains, including for energy storage for batteries. Uh, so it's something a lot of folks are thinking about. Um, and what's really interesting to us at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is we see huge potential here in the state of California itself. We've got lithium deposits in you know, the Salton Sea area. Um, we're calling it Lithium Valley. Well, many folks are calling it Lithium Valley um, to really boost that, uh, that domestic supply chain of lithium. Um, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we're, we're literally developing new chemistries for batteries that aren't gonna be ready next year or the year after. But you know, in a decade or two, and we're still going to be um, needing this, and we're developing chemistries that don't need cobalt or nickel, so we don't have that supply chain issue. Um, uh, so just something a little bit different that I wanted to throw out there. Uh, it's really critical for the United States to make sure that we can manufacture these things. We're, we don't have any manufacturing IP and batteries right now. Uh, it's, it's all coming from Asia, from Europe, et cetera. So thinking about how do we think about the whole supply chain and make sure that we're secure here at home and also that we're providing the jobs that we could be providing to folks here at home um, based, based on the needs in, in energy storage. So I might mention three things. I see that the um, clean energy, the biggest challenge in general is that the investment is upfront. So if you can just pay a little bit today and then pay a little bit more tomorrow, then people don't mind um, paying a little bit today. But when you have to figure out a way to finance the bulk of the, the investment upfront, um, it's so first of all, it's a financial um, challenge. And so like the, um, the DOE's loan program, uh, loan program or other, the rebates or other, there's actually a lot of um, capital out there today, but figuring out ways that we can get the capital to flow in so that people can do it as a little investment today and then pay over time instead of having to do a big investment all up front. And this is when you're looking at equity, um, the, the lower income people just, there's no way they can um, assemble that. Then um, the second one is the issue of reliability. And that builds on this problem of that if you have to do a big upfront investment, um, as we we're just talking, lithium batteries may be the future of the world, but it's going to be really difficult to scale them as fast as the, the demand for, for batteries is just going like a factor of 100 in the next two years or something. And how can the supply chains respond to that? But there are all these other technologies for storage that are more scalable, but the risk associated with them is bigger. And again, if you put this big upfront investment and you're not quite sure what's going to come out. So figuring out the demonstration projects, the ability to be able to do um, high risk, large projects. The third I would say is that um, is one of permitting. Um, the, the, there are delays that are associated and it's interesting that some of the technologies so things that um, say the oil and gas industry have been able to get permits for drilling because they've been doing it for years and they've worked out arrangements where they can get those permits, doing a similar sort of thing that would be going for a storage application or a um, like geothermal or something, the permitting requirements um, may have a different pathway and or if you're doing like 
pumped hydro or something, again, the permitting can take a long time. And so those three things of figuring out how to overcome the financial large upfront investment, how to de-risk some of these new technologies that are really very close to being ready to go, but they are still risky because we don't have enough experience with them. And the third is the permitting. I see that those are the three things um, and of course, there's probably something else I forgot, but those are the two. <laughs> That's a good list, though. That's an excellent list. Um, so we have about maybe two minutes left for our panel, and then we need to turn it back over to Amber. So what I might ask is if there's anything um, burning or exciting or thoughtful on storage that you wanted to say, but didn't get a chance to as we went through the questions. And I'll just see if, if anyone has a, you know, a, a last remark before we turn it back to Amber. Um, Robert, I see you unmuted, so please go ahead. Right. I just want to build on to that last excellent, really an expose of what we need to do as a challenge. And then upfront funding, guys, we have the money now, right? We have billions of dollars of surplus. Now's the time to invest that in three to four year projects, get us to 2025 phase that out a little bit as the private money comes in. Let's not let a crisis like this go to waste when we have such an opportunity to apply funding to technology to need. Any of my other panel members? Yeah, I'll just make a quick announcement. Actually, big announcement this week, we have our save the date out for um, the Bay Area Battery Summit. So save the date, November 3rd and 4th, we're going to be talking about a lot of these issues, but also helping create partnerships between all different types of organizations and, and individuals who want to be making a difference here. So save the date November 3rd and 4th and stay tuned for more information coming out of the Energy Storage Center at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I like it. Joan or Sarah, any, any last words for us? Uh, just that I think solar and storage and energy storage more generally really provides us with an opportunity to improve health equity. And so I think it's a really exciting time for public health in California and, and hopefully different sectors. I'm so excited that I was able to be here today are able to talk to one another and you know share ideas because we're all working on these things in parallel and it's better if we're intersecting. So um, that's my hope. And I would just say over my lifetime, which is longer than most of yours, um, I have seen so many technological breakthroughs. And although this is a really daunting problem that we need to solve, um, the, there's a lot there with technology, but the key thing is we need to go for it. If the technology is not going to come if, we're, if we don't embrace it and encourage it, but if we do, the technology can solve lots of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah and Joan, Noel and Robert, thank you so much for lending your expertise and your time to us today. I thought this panel was really fascinating. Um, I learned a lot. I enjoyed the conversation. And, you know, Amber and team at CCST, thank you so much for inviting us. And with that, let me turn it back over to uh, Amber to um, close us up today. Thank you so much, Jenea. And thank you to all of you panelists. What an excellent conversation. I love how much I get to learn when I hear from all of you. And thanks to our CCST team for organizing these excellent briefings, in particular, Teresa Feo, who leads this for us. It's a whole team behind the scenes here working on this, and I'm really appreciative of them. And I'm grateful to everyone who was able to join us today. If you would like to send this link to anybody, it is available on our website. It's also posted here in the chat. So we will make sure that the video is available on our YouTube channel. There is a one pager that you can download that has contact information for all of our experts so grateful that we could have experts from California and beyond to share insights today about this important topic. Thank you so much and have a lovely day.